everybody. It is such a wonderful feeling to be in Dhaka again. And I know this part of the world much before Bangladesh became officially a country as it is known today. Because in the height of the wind of change, when uh, Kenya was gaining its independence, there was a young law graduate, long, young, young law student from Lahore, who used to come to Kenya very often. We used to go to parties together. We were what we would call, you know, party animals. And uh, today I want to say that uh, Vajid Ali Pani and myself have been friends for over 50 years. And so this part of the world has always been home to me because every time I used to come here, uh, there was a standing order that before I went back to the airport, I had to have breakfast with him, and then uh, his car would take me back. And thank you, Vajid. I've always made you feel very much at home. But besides that, I've had the good fortune over the last many years uh, coming to Bangladesh. Uh, I had worked with His Highness the Aga Khan Secretariat for 31 years. And uh, I do recall the early collaborative efforts of the Aga Khan Foundation with the ICDDR in Bangladesh. There was an economic uh, development organization called the IPDC, which His Highness had a large stake in. Uh, the educational endeavors in this country, which today I believe have produced the Aga Khan education schools, institutions, which rank as good institutions in this country, are part of His Highness's vision uh, to provide quality education globally. And uh, Bangladesh has always been a country uh, that has been very important to the AKDN network's development endeavors. Because I don't know if you are aware, but the work that the ICDDR did in, in Bangladesh under Professor Greenow or somebody in those days was replicated in East Africa. It was also utilized in China and many other parts of the world. And the foundation was one of the catalytic organizations that uh, did make the seed money available at that time. But apart from that, uh, Bangladesh is a country which is at the forefront of a lot of thinking that's taking place. And uh, my visit to the IUB over the last two days, I was amazed to see uh, the value that is placed on education in this country. And I'm, I'm really very happy to see that. I don't say this with condescension, I say it with admiration. Uh, I think what I see uh, reflects the spirit of Rabindranath Tagore, one of my favorite poets, uh, whose intellectual outpouring in art, music, literature, and culture is so deep that my memoir is called Into That Heaven of Freedom. It's the last line of his beautiful poem which talks about the world he aspires for. And that world goes beyond nationalism, it goes beyond religion, it goes beyond culture, but it embodies and embraces the concept of what it means to be human with a universal perspective. So I just want to say that it's been a very, very happy week for us, myself and Dr. Professor Pietroni, who is here. This week uh, has been a week of a lot of good news for us because the endeavor that we're working together, known as the Darwin Center for the Institute for the Study of Compassion, is aiming to produce the compassionate leaders of tomorrow, like the Fulbright scholars or the Rhodes scholars. And uh, yesterday, Dr. Pietroni reminded me that the first center of compassion, global center chair, has been established at a British university, and it was done very recently. I'm happy that that news came to me in Bangladesh this week, apart from one or two other very happy news uh, points. Uh, that my book got published in Kuala Lumpur yesterday and I got the news today. So I think there's been a lot of baraka in Dhaka and I want to thank all of you for this wonderful trip that I've had this time. Having said that, let's start on the subject itself and I hope that I'll be within time. Uh, President, you've given me half an hour, am I right? Let me just make sure that I am within time. It's a little after 8 o'clock, so I'll try and finish a little after 
So let us see what we are talking about this evening. Cosmopolitan ethics in a time of major global change. Uh, I've got some images there, and I'm sure you may be able to uh, identify with them. I think the first one is in Paris at UNESCO. The second one is a major globe with different colored hands and uh, unity and diversity. You know, the whole idea of a society that I think we're all aspiring for in the globe today. But unfortunately, the type of things we see happening today make us wonder that are we really a part of that culture or are we going backwards? You know, you see Brexit in England, you see the type of rhetoric in the States, we see massive population displacements, uh, we see a hearkening to a mythical past that doesn't exist, all in the name of a native populism which is known as purity. Let us make ourselves great again, not forgetting that the world has become so mixed and we cannot create a world today unless we embrace this beautiful principle of diversity. So let us see what is pluralism. Identifying in pluralism is one of the most important things. Identifying with the other. Identify. Sorry. Okay, let's see if we get it right this time. Yes. Identifying in pluralism is one We've got Professor Pietroni who says we've got to be compassionate, yes. and we've got you as my lawyer. <laughs> Identifying in pluralism is one of the most important things. Identifying with the other. Identifying with that person who is not you and who would never be you because they may be another color, another race, another religion, have other cultural values, that recognition that they are they and you are you is terribly important and that is the basis of pluralism. Respect for press freedom, it seems to me, grows out of a respect for pluralism as a cornerstone of peace and progress. Pluralism implies a readiness to listen to many voices, whether we agree with them or not and a readiness to embrace a rich diversity of cultures. That was His Highness at one of the public lectures he gave recently. So you may now ask, why pluralism? What is this notion of listening to the other even if we do not agree with him or her? Well, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum in the Middle East, in UAE, said tolerance is the basis for building societies and promoting values of peaceful coexistence today. We need to be more tolerant and united to face the changes happening around us. His Highness mentions pluralism is no longer simply an asset or a prerequisite for progress, but vital to our existence. So it's no longer a choice. We cannot have peace unless we are pluralistic. Now what causes all this? Globalization, what is it? There are as many definitions as there are detractors and supporters. It's the proverbial elephant in the room. And I'm not going to indulge in all sorts of definitions because this is not a PhD class. But let's try and see what we understand by this notion. And there's a beautiful little anecdote. What is the truest definition of globalization? Princess Diana's death. How come? An English princess with an Egyptian boyfriend crashes in a French tunnel, driving a German car with a Dutch engine, driven by a Belgian who was high on Scottish whiskey, followed closely by Italian paparazzi on Japanese motorcycles treated by an American doctor using Brazilian medicines. And this is sent to you by an Indian using American technology. And you are probably reading this on your computer that uses Taiwanese chips 
and Korean-made monitors assembled by Bangladeshi workers in a Singapore plant, transported by lorries driven by Pakistanis, hijacked by Indonesians, unloaded by Sicilian longshoremen, and trucked to you by Mexican illegals. That's globalization. Globalization is here to stay, whether we like it or not. And as Kofi Annan puts it so beautifully, that it is like arguing against the laws of gravity. And he's a member of the International Board of Directors for the Global Center of Pluralism, which you may know is now situated in Ottawa, and he's now studying the pathology of conflict globally and going into new areas of conflict resolution, uh, which has not really been studied so deeply before. But globalization also has a downside. You know, I, I live with this particular example because my wife is at this moment in Peru. I just got an email to say that I'm in Mexico and I'm coming back in the weekend. Uh, she is setting up clinical programs in various parts of the world. And she reminds me that the millennial goals are receding because it TB still ranks as a leading cause of death worldwide estimated incidence is 9.6 million people, 1 million children, and 12% are HIV positive. Only two-thirds of these are reported. TB killed 1 million people in that one year with 140,000 children. And yet it costs about $20 to cure a person of tuberculosis. Probably what it costs to eat a McDonald's in some countries. And yet, that's something which we cannot reach. This is just one example. There are many other examples where cultural degradation takes place. Uh, uh, they reckon there are a couple of thousand languages that will just totally be defunct because people are now losing their cultures. So globalization has its positives. It also has a lot of negatives. And what we see today, I think, is a response, irrational possibly, against some of the forces that globalization has influenced or unleashed. Yes. And I feel terribly sad to notice that even at the levels of governments, uh, we are not coming to grips with the issues at hand. Uh, I think there's a lot of obfuscation we see globally because we're going through a transition from a society, an informational society, which is leaping forward at an exponential rate. And people are talking about immigrants taking jobs away. Nobody has ever mentioned in all the election campaigns that 47% of the jobs in America will be taken over by robots. So it's no longer that I don't like you because you don't look like me. Do I like the robot or not? And I'm told as a mediation specialist that the future conflict will not be between human beings. He said we have to come to grips with how we're going to deal with the robots. So algorithms are taking over. And if you look at the global exponential rate of growth, there are three areas that are changing the force, the nature of life. Climate change, globalization, and exponential technology. These are the three major drivers of where the world is going to move in the next few years. So what are the conflicts that are arising? Well, we see tsunami, we see genocide, we see terrorism, we see viruses. We have no real solutions unless we all work together. Without collaborating in today's world, there can be no solutions to the problems. And tragically and ironically, the solutions that are proffered are more based on native populism rather than the global uh, principles that we need to embody and make them work productively for where we want to be. Accepting diversity doesn't come easy. I was just talking to Professor Rahman and Ambassador Pani earlier, our sisters who were in the room there. I lived in South Africa at a very, very difficult stage of its evolution. Uh, there is Nelson Mandela had to spend 10,000 days in prison before we could keep our head up that we were human beings. Apartheid 
had to be dismantled. But it took a man 10,000 days to be in a jail cell the size of his own body, but he refused to give up. So racism doesn't go away. And there's a study done at Princeton University that says that throughout history, those societies that embraced pluralism saw progress that was unprecedented. So pluralism is nothing new. I mean, it's a new concept that we talk about, but let's go back. The Roman Empire respected pluralism. It was a pluralistic empire. Al-Andalus, the Umayyads ruled Spain from around 709 till 1492. There's Averroes, Ibn Rushd, a Muslim, Ibn Maymun, Maimonides, a Jew, and Thomas Aquinas. It was a very, Cordoba was a very pluralistic setting. Now this was Spain in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century. That was a pluralistic setting. Gave the world the Alhambra, contributed to music, to art, to literature. The Fatimids from 900, uh, 909 to 1171 was a Shia caliphate in, in uh, North Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, and then it sort of split over into the Mediterranean in Sicily and beyond. It was a very pluralistic uh, empire, and it was legalistic, legally pluralistic in which different laws operated in the same geographical uh, area. And it inf its influence extended right up to Central Asia, to what is today uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and uh, produced some very outstanding people. One of the greatest uh, poets of Tajikistan, Nasser Khosrow, uh, was a product of that period. The Ottoman Empire, it embraced different cultures and ethnicities. It engendered pluralism. This is what I was discussing today. We were discussing with Professor Petroni, whose family comes from the Ottoman Empire. It was a very, very pluralistic polity. Uh, the Jews, there were Christians, there were Muslims, there were Turks. Uh, again, a very rich empire with a, a pluralistic ethic. More recently, we see examples of Canada and the United States. Fortunately, it's a shaky concept. I'm a Canadian. I remember when my second book was launched was the night that Mr. Trudeau won the elections. I was at the Ismaili Center in Toronto, and two of the MPs who came to the book launch had just come out of the election victory. And I remember saying, thank you, Mr. Trudeau. You've put the color back into the Canadian flag. Because unfortunately, the notion of pluralism is like health. We can't take it for granted and successive governments can have different political agendas. And unfortunately, for a period of time in Canada, this whole principle of pluralism was woefully vulnerable. I'm very happy to say that Junior Trudeau is his father's son. And today, if I'm not mistaken, the defense minister in Canada is a Punjabi, he's Sikh. Uh, uh, I, one of the ministers is a son of a Ugandan refugee, Ismaili guy. Uh, the mayor of Calgary is uh, Nanshi, whose mother brought him in a show when, he, when they had to run away from Uganda. And today he's one of the best mayors, or the 100 best mayors in the Western Hemisphere. So there are countries who, when they embrace pluralism, are able to get the best out of people. It's when that factor is destroyed that that country will take centuries to recover. Uh, my one little example goes back to Uganda in 1972 when I was a lawyer in Nairobi. There's a young man from Uganda called Professor Karim who was the world expert on prostaglandins, a hormone that is used in uh, stimulating uh, childbirth. I'm not a medical man, I hope I've got it right. The man, Idi Amin, said he wants the Indians out of Uganda in 90 days, otherwise they will end up on the Nile 
in the stomachs of the crocodiles. Professor Karim got on the plane, and when they realized who he was, the army people came in and said, you can't leave, you are a Ugandan. But he said, am I a Ugandan or am I an Indian? What am I? They said, no, 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 you're a Ugandan. So they pulled him out and took him off. His wife and children had already left the country. Eventually, where does he find himself? In Singapore. Lee Kuan Yew heard that this was the world's authority in prostate glands. He invited Karim to the University of Singapore and gave him the head of the Department of Biochemistry. And when Lee died, they said they quoted this particular example that here is a society that did, does respect meritocracy. And when meritocracy is respected, then the issue of where you come from, who you are, who your mother, who your father was, does not become a major factor in the definition of identity. Where does the problem arise? And I think that we cannot overlook the colonial heritage. I have two pictures there. One of you who are great enthusiasts of travel will notice that that's Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. One of the most beautiful spots in the world if any of you want to go to see the wildlife parks. The other one is Mumbai. And you may say, what have the two got to do with each other? Well, very interesting. Mount Kilimanjaro was given by Queen Victoria to her grandson Kaiser Wilhelm as a birthday present. He said, Daddy, or Nani, whatever she was, it's my birthday, you got two mountains and I've got none. So what does grandmother say? Don't worry, Beta, when is your birthday? You can take the mountain. So he took the mountain. Birthday present. What happens in Bombay? Catherine of Braganza gets married to Charles II of England. You call it Dej, I don't know what you call it in Bengali. The woman has to bring something into the marriage. So she brings Bombay along. And I think they threw in 10 years as an extra. Now you ask yourself, what does this mean to nationalities, to peoples, to boundaries, to cultures? So you find in Tanzania, during the First World War, the Maasai's, half of them were in Germany and half were in British. And incidentally, Germany and Britain were fighting each other because they were both grandchildren of Queen Victoria. So half the Maasai killed the other half because they were well, half were in the German army and the other one were in the British army. Now you may say that sounds quite critical, but these are some of the colonial conferences. Come 1885, the whole of Africa is carved out at the Berlin Conference, the scramble for Africa. So you have colonial powers who rule these countries. And of course, this is not a lecture on what type of colonial policies were followed. I'm not an anti-colonialist, I'm a product of British education. But I think we can't overlook the fact that problems today do last, do reside in the politics of yesterday. This is global. Decolonization Africa and Asia. If you see the first photograph, some of you are old enough to realize that in 1955 you had the historic Bandung Conference that led to the decolonization of Africa, Jawaharlal Nehru, Kwame Nkrumah, Jamal Abdel Nasser, Sukarno, and Tito. These were the great protagonists of the decolonization of Africa. And of course, Nehru was uh, playing a major role at that time because India had just become independent and uh, it played a very critical role in third world uh, thinking. That picture there, of course, is Kwame Nkrumah and Martin Luther King. Uh, again, a remarkable man for his contribution. Fast forward, that's 500 years later after I spoke about the seeds of conflict in the earlier part. What are the unresolved issues that the world has to now contend with? The Middle East, great spot, Kashmir, many parts of Africa, Latin America, the ex-Soviet Union, and incidentally, I mean, this uh, PowerPoint was put together some time ago, maybe a few months ago, but I went to a, a, a meeting last week in England, the Universal Federation of Peace evening, where Humphrey Hoxley gave a talk 
And he says the next big conflict area is writing a book called Asian Waters. And he says the next war are maritime wars for influence in the whole of the continents. And it's all in Asia. Five major trigger spots is mentioned are in Asia. So those are some of the unresolved issues. And they go back to the Opium Wars. They go to what Japan did in Manchuria, 1941, uh, India and China, northern uh, uh, parts. Uh, all those are major. Taiwan, 1949, these are major areas. And Humphrey Hawksley's book that comes out, I believe, is going to be very, very fascinating to have a look at. Uh, I found his analysis very, very riveting for those of you who are interested in that. Contemporary expressions of the problems, genocide, that is Yugoslavia, migration, major, major issue, major issue. In fact, today, the whole notion of family mediation in Europe has to grapple with the fact that you've got to look at the possibility of mediating family conflict when the notion of family won't be the same that people knew where they came from. And the new configurations today, my famous line in global mediation is, the family of today is bicultural, biracial, bilingual, binational, bi-religious. Hopefully not bipolar, but that basically is what the world is becoming today. And how do you mediate those type of conflicts? I mean, but who do you mediate with? How do you mediate them? And how do you find solutions? Solutions of which religion will you follow? Who will have the kid? Which country will the kid go to? What law will apply? How will you make these things? And I was telling somebody about this, and they said, no, but this will happen in the future. I said, it's happened yesterday already. There's nothing like future. The future has arrived already. So these are some of the issues where a cosmopolitan ethic has to kick in. Otherwise, we will not be able to deal with human issues. Now that's not enough, as if we didn't have enough problems, starting with what Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama did. We have new problems. We have the digital revolution, Moore's law. Every 18 months, your computer has double the power and capacity with the result that today computers have outstripped the human brain by a billion to one. So you're a medical practitioner, you see a patient and you see five of these scans. Your computer can do a billion scans in about 10 minutes, eight minutes. So are you going to produce doctors on side streets? Some parts of the world, one robot will be able to service 1.5 million people. One robot. Are you going to train doctors? And these are just questions. What's going to happen to the whole taxi industry when you have driverless cars? What's going to happen to the hotel industry when Airbnb take over completely? So these are the transitions we are now facing which will give rise to massive conflicts, disruptive innovations, conflicts and tensions. People don't talk anymore. Right? It's your phone. Go to any part of the world, even in meetings today, seven people, they'll have seven conversations with seven other people in seven other countries. So why do you have corporate meetings? Nobody's listening. All right, that's a corporate meeting. I went to a conference and one Englishman came to me. He said, can you help me, sir? I said, why? He said, I want to talk to my teenage daughter in my living room. I have to text her. I said, put your phone down so I can talk to you. This is the reality today. We're living it. What, how are you going to deal with conflict and what is the nature of our relationship with dealing with difference? Differences are not only really cultural, political, ideological or religious. Differences are between generations. Our children inhabit a world that we have are passing. And they're going to say, hey man, dad, Gabriel, man. In America they'll say, hey man, no kidding. You must get real. Because we're going through major transitions. Transitions of identity, transitions of culture. Search for meaning. There is going to have to be a new search for meaning. And this is where the compassion endeavor that we are looking at
talks about how do you bring compassion back to human society? What type of society are we going to be living when Homo sapiens, the human race, faces the danger of extinction? We, we've destroyed the environment and we're probably very close to destroying ourselves. If it's not climate, it may be a nuclear war. Then we go to challenges to pluralism. See that in many, many countries, in Asia, in Africa, in North America, in Europe, enabling mechanisms. This is again, the UAE government has set up the National Tolerance Program. Not that this doesn't happen in other countries, but this is the slide I used when I spoke at the Ismaili Center in Dubai. And I was just trying to see that some of, it's interesting that one of the concepts they were speaking about is enrich scientific and cultural content, integrate international efforts to promote tolerance and highlight the leading role, but that's what they say there. Yeah. Promote tolerance among young people and prevent them from fanaticism and extre extremism. Consolidate the role of family in nation building. Strengthens government's role as an incubator of tolerance. But it's a joint endeavor in any country. It cannot be done alone by civil society or by communities or by individuals. Canada, for example, this is when the Global Center for Pluralism was started. The Aga Khan said, a tribute to and drawing on Canada's experience of pluralist democracy. This research and education center will work closely with governments, academia, and civil society in cultural diverse countries. The aim will be to foster policy and legislation that enables pluralism to take root in all spheres of modern life, law, justice, the arts, media, financial services, health, and education. Every one of these fields calls for the acceptance of pluralism. We cannot live without it. And I sometimes shudder to think I live in Britain, and uh, the other day uh, I had a minor surgical intervention. Interesting. My doctor was Dr. Aurora from the Punjab, born in England. My anesthetist was Rihanna Chowdhury, Pakistani background. My major nurse was Congolese. The person in the recovery room was Carolyn. And the person who took me to the taxi was a Jamaican. And the person who brought me home was a Bangladeshi driver. I didn't see one Englishman there. But this is now the truth of so many hospitals in England. You know, you have names like Kawasaki, Aurora, Chowdhury, uh, or Jumbo, these are people who are in at the cutting edge of, of the medical profession. I'm not talking of other professions. I mean, Canada is a case in point. I quote this very often. The world's leading lung and transplant surgeon in the world, the person who did the first operation that succeeded, was the East African little boy who came at the age of 14. The leading brain surgeon today who removes a tumor through the nose is the son of a Ugandan refugee. The man who promoted the whole notion of the club foot technology was thrown out as a little kid. He had polio when they threw him out. And ironically, he went and he pioneered this new uh, technology at the Mulago Hospital in Kampala as he grew up. Saved 10,000 kids from the same problem. So I think there is a lot in pluralism. What are the ways forward? President, do I have another seven minutes? A more robust civil society. Critical. And indeed, more meaningful education. Now what do we understand by more meaningful education? I have quoted this particular poem all over the world in 11 countries when I did my book launch. And I will read it to you. Please forgive me. You, your children probably sing this every morning where the mind is free and the heart is without fear, where knowledge is free, where the world is not broken up in fragment by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way for, into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee, into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my Father, 
let my country awake. It's Rabindranath Tagore. I think every person that has read this poem has said it reflects what we aspire for. This is a man who said this almost a hundred years ago. So what is cosmopolitanism? It's an ideology that all humans belong to a single community based on a shared morality. A person adheres to the idea in any of its form is called a cosmopolitan or cosmopolite. It was there in 412 BC in Greece. The Stoics developed the idea further and stressed that each human being dwells in two communities, the local community of our birth and the community of human argument and aspiration. We belong to more than one identity. A person who's done a lot of work on this is Kwame Anthony Apaya. Kwame Apaya is the grandson of Sir Stafford Cripps. He delivered the Greece lectures last year. Apaya says we are responsible for every other human being. But he says this you cannot do at the cost of your own welfare. But he says it's incumbent on you to study human conflict and be aware of the next person's issues and problems. Academically, it sounds brilliant. There are many critiques of this particular principle. But Apaya has done a lot of work on this. And interestingly enough, Apaya is a product of a biracial marriage. His mother was from a British family. Uh, Sir Stafford Cripps was on the Labour government at the time, very prominent person who came to uh, the subcontinent here to meet Jinnah and Gandhi and Nehru and all of them. Uh, but he says that we, we need to understand the root causes of these ills so that we can influence larger policy dimensions. So Paya has done a lot of work in this field, to which the Aga Khan again has this as his passion when he says a cosmopolitan ethic is rooted in a strong culture of tolerance. He says a society which not only accepts difference but actively seeks to understand it and learn from it. In this perspective, diversity is not a burden to be endured but an opportunity to be welcomed. A cosmopolitan society regards the distinctive threads of our particular identities as elements that bring beauty to the larger social fabric. A cosmopolitan ethic accepts our ultimate moral responsibility to the whole of humanity rather than absolutizing a presumably exceptional part. A readiness to participate in a true dialogue with diversity. A readiness to listen. He said we sometimes look, talk too much about how we are all alike that we neglect the wonderful ways in which we can be different. Abstract universalism gives, me, gives rise to an unhappy counter-reaction. He says there are challenges. Let's not be, what's the word in English, uh, blue-eyed and bushy-tailed. I mean, let's be real. He says, let's be real. There are challenges. It doesn't come automatically. He said we need to respect both what we have in common and what makes us different. What are the challenges? The problem of economic insecurity. It's going rampant right through the world. If you read Noam Chomsky's recent book, where he says uh, despair or, op or optimism, read Matthew and Kona post truth Thomas Friedman. This is the psychosis of fear that's driving most of native populism today in many countries. Economic insecurity. Advances that paradoxically create problems, longevity through technology, need for leadership, information explosion. There's a lot of uh, information, there's, very, and there's more noise than signal today. Need for quality education. Resonances with the world's great ethical and religious traditions so beautifully encapsulated in the Quran, where it says, O mankind, fear your Lord, who created you of a single soul, and from it created its mate, and from the pair of them scattered abroad many men and women. Cosmopolitan ethic is one that will honor both our common humanity and our distinctive identities, each re re reinforcing the other as part of the high moral calling. And what Yaga Khan here says, 
He says we should not embrace cosmopolitanism because we think it's convenient. You embrace it as part of the notion that your own being is entangled with the being of the other through the process that we do. We are all created from a single soul. It's, it's basically your understanding who you are. And that is beautifully encapsulated in the Quran where it says, O man, can be careful of your duty to your Lord who created you from a single soul and join your heart in love so that by his grace you became brethren. And there's a second one which says, We have created you male and female, made you nations and tribes that you may know one another. The noblest of you in the sight of Allah is the best in conduct. Allah is knower aware. Basically, this is a major discourse. I'm also very excited to mention to you that uh, when I was uh, so privileged to, uh, to receive the Gandhi Award, uh, the great admirer of Mahatma Gandhi, I'm also a great admirer of Martin Luther King and Dr. Ikeda, there was a round table conference that was held in America in which I participated. And uh, one of the things that came out in this discourse uh, there were five major academics that participated. Uh, Lawrence Carter of Moros College said that we need to we need to teach our children about this for tomorrow. And so I got up and I said, why don't we have a book of the deliberations? And he said, that's a good idea. <laughs> and so we got some volunteers together. And I also got the news this week. It's being taught for the first time in America to undergraduates at Moros College which is Martin Luther King's alma mater, that they want to now teach American kids at the undergraduate level the notion of cosmopolitanism in a globalized world. 